Okay, we were talking about vision and uh, the retina, the rods and cones that are sensitive to light. So, what happens is in the dark, these uh, cells, rods and cones, are depolarized and they release glutamate, which is a signal to the bipolar cells, and this is the signal that it's relatively dark. Whereas when their light is shown upon them, they become what are what we call hyperpolarized, and no glutamate is released. So basically, what happens in the dark, sodium ions are able to flow in, and the inside of the cell is less negative than it might be otherwise. In the light, where in the light the flow of sodium is stopped, so the inside of the cell becomes even more negative or hyperpolarized. And that is essentially <clears throat> the signal that light is present. So here we are on the retina, and this on the left is the inside of the eye, and here is the basically the base of the retina. And so the light shines through, and when it hits these rods and cones, again they're stimul stimulated in the light, and um, or they respond to the light, I should say, and that sends a certain signal to the um, to the cells, these bipolar cells, which is basically the, which are basically the ones that connect to the nerve cells. And you notice in between there are these horizontal cells and these amacrine cells, and they're ones that connect either different photoreceptors in the case of the horizontal cells or different nerve cells in the case of uh, this part of the retina. And they can integrate information across the retina. <clears throat> All right. So again, the signal travels to these ganglion cells and then to the nerve cells and can be passed along to different uh, nerve cells, either with these horizontal cells or these amacrine cells. And it gets translated into a nerve impulse, traveling to the brain where you process that information. And because of what you know, you associate what you're seeing with certain things. There's a crossing of some of these from one eye to the opposite hemisphere. And you can see the visual processing primarily occurs on the back side of the brain. All right, so the skeleton. Um, you can define a skeleton in different ways. It's what allows for movements. And for example, with a hydrostatic skeleton, there's nothing hard inside the organism, but what it uses is basically the pressure of the fluid, the water, for the most part inside that organism to create pressure against the outer, basically the skin of the organism, if you will. And then those muscles can contract to squeeze certain parts of the organism and force the fluid into other parts. And it can use this wave-like motion to, to move. And that's how, for example, an earthworm moves is through contraction of the muscles in different parts of the organism, which squeezes the liquid, this hydrostatic skeleton, and allows them to move. Some, like um, insects and, and uh, crabs and lobsters, etc., have an exoskeleton that uh, muscles can be attached to. As I think we talked about earlier, if such an animal wants to grow, it has to shed its old exoskeleton or molt, and then it quickly expands and then the new exoskeleton hardens up. An endoskeleton, like we have, um, is convenient in that it allows for continuous growth. You don't have to molt or anything like that. And again, it's the place where muscles are attached. It's our uh, voluntary muscles, the uh, skeletal muscles. And so um, you don't have to memorize these names like you did freshman year. But um, you may see those terms. Um, now we have different joints, as you recall, a hinge joint, hinge joint here, ball and socket joint, a pivot joint. Uh, remember in the skull we have fixed joints. There are different bones in the skull, but they're sort of locked in place, except for the, uh, the jaw bone and the mandible, of course. <coughs> okay. So muscles themselves. 
uh, you'll recall that with the skeletal muscle, when you're going to move a joint, you have muscles that are working in opposition to each other. You have the uh, flexor, the one that flexes or bends the joint, like your biceps, and then the triceps, which extends the joint. So flexors and extensors, extenders are the way that muscles work at joints, to bend the joint. About muscle itself, um, the basic unit of muscle is what's called a sarcomere, and you have these actin and myosin protein filaments that slide past each other. They come together when the muscle is contracting and slide back apart when the muscle is relaxing. And you have a bunch of these sarcomeres all in a row uh, to make up this thing called a myofibril, and you have a bunch of myofibrils together to make a muscle fiber, and then a bunch of muscle fibers to make a muscle, a bundle of muscle fibers, and then you put those together to make a, a muscle, and so they all work together to contract and relax that muscle. It takes energy to do this, and so with uh, uh, ATP present, these proteins can slide past one in each other to cause the sarcomere again to contract. Um, so what happens is with skeletal muscle in particular, you'll have neurons that are attached to the muscle cells. And when that neuron depolarizes and it's passed on to the muscle, the muscle will then become depolarized and causes a contraction. And so how that happens is that this neurotransmitter acetylcholine is released um, into the muscle cell or into the junction between the muscle cell which causes the um, this structure oops, called the, here it is, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which surrounds the sarcoplasm to release a bunch of calcium ions, which again causes this depolarization and the contraction of the muscle fiber. Um, Muscle, skeletal muscle comes in different types, slow and fast, and these are the slow twitch and fast twitch muscles, and apparently the amount of those different things you have can determine whether you're a good sprinter or a good marathon runner. Cardiac muscle, um, you'll remember you have the sinoatrial, sinoatrial and atrioventricular nodes, so there's no nerve cells necessary to cause them to contract. That's not required. Smooth muscle. Um, so these are, again, the ones that surround the digestive tract. Um, and they are stimulated by neurons and are part of your autonomic nervous system. Okay, so that's it for the nervous system and sensory organs.